So uh, we were talking about voltage last time, and I uh, had just gotten a chance to kind of sketch out how you would do a problem. So let me remind you of that, and then we'll go back and we'll actually do an example, much like the ones that you have on your homework, okay? So let's say we have a bunch of charges, Q1, Q2, Q3, and we have a point P that's in their neighborhood, and we're interested in finding out about that point. One option is, of course, to calculate the electric field, which you did in homework one. Another option is to find out the voltage. So how do you do that? Well, both the formula for figuring out the voltage of a point charge is KQ over R. So all you have to do is say, what is the charge is making this voltage, and how far are you away from it? So one thing you need to do first, you need to figure out if you want to find the voltage contributed by charge 1, you'd have to find R1. And that's a distance. It's positive. So no need to worry about sign. It's just a distance. For Q2, you'd find this distance, R2, and this, R3. And depending on how the question is phrased, um, you would need to do perhaps some geometry, but really what you're looking at is just to find the straight line distance between the point in question and the um, charge that's making the voltage there. Um, now the R is always positive, but depending on Q, um, Q, that may be positive or negative, and that is what's going to lend the sign to the voltage. So positive charges make positive voltage, negative charges make negative voltage. Um, so I talk, characterize these as like V equals zero is like your baseline for where you don't have anything around, but positive charges make positive voltage or voltage hills, and negative charges make voltage valleys, val regions of negative voltage around them. So then, what you do, if you want to find out about point P, you have to find out the voltage at point P by adding up, of course, all the charges in the neighborhood. But this is a far easier addition because it's a scalar addition, which means you're adding up a string of numbers. There's no Sokotoa involved, there's no vector addition, it's a string of numbers. It may be a list of positive and negative numbers. Positive charges make positive voltage, negative charges make negative voltage, but it's nonetheless a very easy sum. It's just adding up a string of numbers. And ultimately what that gets you, should you decide to put something at point P, say a charge little q, then simply multiplying the voltage at point P, which is a property of the location, by little q, which is what you're deciding to put there, it will tell you how much energy is stored in little q by being around these other charges. Um, now, it's technically can be said that that's potential energy stored in the entire system. It's questionable to say that little q owns it. It's really shared. But in reality, we're going to fix the other ones. So these are going to be considered held down or, or not movable. So the only charge that can do anything about the fact that there's stored energy that needs to be gotten rid of is little q. So it just makes sense to assign it to little q, because little q is the only thing that's going to ditch it by going somewhere else. So what's going to happen to little q, it's going to want to lower its potential energy, but when it lowers the potential energy, it's going to go into kinetic energy. So as this decreases, this is going to increase, the sum is going to be conserved. So as it flies off, now one of the things that voltage is bad at is calculating exactly what direction it's going to fly off. But if it's a positive charge, it's certainly going to fly away and be repelled by other positive charges. So even though we're not sure if it flies this way exactly, or this way, or this way, its eventual home is going to be very far away, r equals infinity. So r final is infinity. And if you look at the formula here, when you get infinitely far away from all of these charges, they all contribute zero, right? So R equals infinity, that's going to mean that V final is zero. And of course, if you multiply the charge into zero, it means that the final potential energy is zero. So what we have here is that the charge is going to have converted all of the potential energy it had at first into kinetic energy. That's kind of the way these problems go. So I'm going to do an example that's going to kind of have this general gist, not exactly, but general idea. Um, just so you see something that's reasonably like the homework, um, you can kind of see how it goes. And along the way, I'm going to also incorporate some of the graphs that I mentioned. These voltage hills and valleys, you can sketch them, so I want to put that in there as well. So here's one example. I have an x-axis x equals 0. And let me go ahead and put a um, couple of charges in here. 
going to put a uh, minus q1. No, sorry, this one's plus. That's plus q1 and minus q2. I'll tell you where they're located. They're located at x equals minus 1 and x equals plus 1. They're symmetric around the origin. And then they're also going to be symmetric charges. So q1 is going to be plus 1 nanocoulomb, and q2 is going to be minus 1 nanocoulomb. Right? Um, so that's my setup. And the fact that I've labeled them capital Q strongly suggests that these are going to be the fixed charges that make the voltage. Uh, but they're held down, they're not going to attract, well, they're going to attract each other, but they can't actually move together. We kind of hammer them down, we nail them in, those are fixed. And we're interested in, first, finding out about the landscape that they create for, around them. So, uh, part A is I want to find the voltage at point A and at point B. And let me tell you what these points are. Uh, point A is at x equals negative 0.5 meters, and point B is at the origin. Okay. I guess I can sketch them in here. Uh, point A is right about here, and point B is here. So that's going to be my first question, just finding the, or the voltage at specific points. That's good practice. And then part B, I want a general sketch of B versus x. I just want to get a general sense of what the voltage looks like everywhere along this x-axis. Um, and then, of course, the only reason we care about the landscape created by these two charges is if we're going to eventually probably put a, another charge in to react. So let's have that be part C. If we release a Q is plus one coulomb charge, a uh, mass of one kilogram, from rest at point A, what is its speed when it reaches point B? And then I guess I'll add just in general, then what happens? Okay? So it'll reach point B, is that the end of the line for it, or what happens, what might happen to it after that if we let it run some more? Okay, so that's the setup. Are there any questions on the setup before I go ahead and do it? Okay, so let me just clear a little space here. Hopefully you remember the strategy or at least have it accessible there on your paper. So let's go ahead and calculate um, the voltage at point A. Well, all we have to do is find out what are the contributions from the two charges. So KQ1 over R1 plus KQ2 over R2. No vector addition needed. We're just adding up a string of numbers. The formula is very straightforward. The only thing we really need to do here, we've already been given the charges, um, is we need to figure out how far are we away from each charge when we're at point A. So if we're looking at point A, how far am I away from charge 1? 0.5 meters, right? So in this case, R1 is 0.5 meters. It's a positive distance. It's just how far. And how about R2? How far are you away from charge 2 when you're at point A? Okay, 1.5 meters, right? This far. Uh, so I'm not caring about anything else, just distances. This is 0.5 meters. This is 1.5 meters, that's it. So we put those in along with the charges. Let's see what we find. We find this first one, first of all, it's a positive charge, so it's going to be a positive voltage. And if you plug that in, um, you're going to find it should be plus 18 volts. The second one, it's a negative charge, so it should be a negative voltage. It should be minus 6. So we have one positive number contributed, another negative. Shouldn't be any surprise, hopefully. The, char the charges are equal and opposite, but we're not equally distant from them, right? It's no wonder we're closer to the positive charge, so it overall comes out positive, right? Plus 18 is bigger than minus 6. So we find overall 
plus 12 volts when we're there. So that is the voltage at point A. Are there any questions how I got that before I move on to the next point? Okay, so let's do that. Voltage at point B. Same thing. The only thing I need to do is figure out the distances, and now, how far am I away from both charges? One meter. Can anyone see what the voltage is going to come out to be without having to compute it? Zero. Zero. Exactly. Because everything else is the same except one's plus and gives a positive voltage, other one's minus, we should get a zero. Okay. So that right there gives me the voltage at the two specific points, in fact the two specific points that are mentioned in part C, but before I move on down to that, let's go ahead and make an overall sketch. Now instead of just writing down the voltage values at two specific points, let's say what it would look like everywhere. So part B, I guess I'll do over here. Let's imagine that we were walking along the x-axis and plot the voltage we would see. So remember that positive charges make voltage hills and negative charges make voltage valleys. In fact, we might, just for the purposes of drawing, imagine those two things separately. So let's draw a voltage hill that's centered on where this positive charge is. That's minus one meter. So at minus one meter, we expect a peak. It looks like this. So positive voltage, and the more closer we are to the, the charge, the more higher they will be. In fact, this is really a, a peak without any top. It's a hill that has no top. In fact, if you get right on top of it, you'll notice that R equals zero. It will go to not just plus 18, but plus infinity, right? So it's a, it's a hill that really has no finite top. So that would be the voltage hill made by the positive charge. And then a negative charge makes negative voltage everywhere. And it bottoms out at minus infinity. It's a voltage valley. And that's going to be located where the charge is located. So that's at my, uh, plus one meter. And I'll go ahead and I'll draw in. It makes negative voltage everywhere. That doesn't go up to zero until you get really far away. So we're kind of imagining the hill and the valley in isolation here. Now, of course, what we, we don't want to plot just the voltage of one and, or the other. We want to plot what their combination is. So the voltage we're looking to plot is V1 plus V2. That's what's ultimately going to govern anything in the vicinity. Is It's going to be influenced by both charges. Now, V1 is always going to make a positive voltage. And so if that were there a positive charge alone, this doesn't actually go down to zero voltage until you get very, very far away. And likewise, the second charge alone only makes negative voltage. That wouldn't climb up till zero until you got very far away. But of course, we just found that it is possible for the voltage to be zero, and in fact, the voltage is zero at the origin. And the reason why you can think of is that the hill and the valley kind of fill each other in. So if we were to sketch the voltage overall, it would look a lot like the ch one charge when you're very near it, right? Of course, when you're really close to one, it just dominates. But then, this, doesn't, this falls off quicker because, of course, there's a negative value being contributed. So it kind of looks like this. So that's what the overall voltage looks like. And landscape-wise, it just looks like a hill next to a valley, right? It's not that different. It's not that different looking than what is the two of them alone. But you can imagine that if you had a really tall mountain next to a really deep valley, that there would be some point that you could walk between them where you would never deviate from sea level, right? And that's what you have right here. You have a point where the voltage is zero. 
even though either one alone would never make something zero that close by, because you have a positive next to a negative, in so, some respects the hill can fill in the, the valley can fill in the hill, right? Does that make sense? In fact, if we were, if we wanted to, we could even mark down these two points on our graph, right? This is point B. Point B, the voltage is zero. And by the way, that only happened to be the case right exactly between them because they're exactly equal charges. So on the homework, of course, what I do is I throw in a little twist. I make the two charges unequal. And then you have to ask, where is that point where they're contributing equally and adding to zero? <coughs> And so you can think, is it closer to the big charge or is it closer to the small charge, right? So that's one of the homework questions. <coughs> that's point B and point A. Uh, that, I guess point A was right about here uh, at minus 0 0.5 meters. And there we found that the voltage was 18 volts. So we're definitely up toward the hill side instead of the valley side, right? But we're not yet, of course, climbed all the way up to that infinite peak, right? So that's kind of what the overall graph looks like. As you walk along the x-axis, you see the voltage climb hit its peak when you're on top of the positive charge, go back down, reach zero when you got to the origin, and then you climb down into the valley and back out as you pass the negative charge. Okay. Are there any questions on part B before I do part C? Yeah? The homework asks us to draw a graph mm -hmm. that would well, it's going to be a little bit different because you're not going to have an equally sized yeah. hill and valley. You're going to have one that's bigger than the other. And that's going to affect where this point is where they have equal influence. Okay. In fact, there's a question on homework one which is almost identical. Where is it that these things have equal influence, right? So you just have to imagine that this is bigger or smaller than this. I don't remember which way it is. So just give a little thought to how that shifts that, that point. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, so part C. Part C is we're releasing a charge from point A. It's a positive charge. So I'll draw it in here, it's a positive charge. And I guess the first thing I should clarify is how do I even know it's going to move towards point B? How do I know it's going to go from A to B? like this and not the other way around, how do I know if I release it at point A, it doesn't go to the left? Well, if I look at my sketch, of course I remember that positive charges like to go to lower voltage. So going from point A to point B is definitely towards lower voltage, right? In fact, I kind of like even imagining that it's kind of like rolling off the hillside, right? Positive charges like to roll downhill. They like to roll off of the voltage hills, okay? And we can calculate exactly how fast it's going to go when it reaches the destination because, of course, if a positive charge goes to lower voltage, it sheds potential energy. Where does it go? It goes to kinetic energy, and we can ask what its speed is. So let's do that. So I'm going to do Ke initial plus Pe initial, and account for my energy at the end as well, Ke final plus Pe final. My initial point here is, of course, point A. And my final point is B. All right, what's my initial kinetic energy? Zero. zero. Is it zero because it's always zero, or is it, why is it zero? So it's at rest. I release it from rest. Okay, so in the problem, the homework problem, if you say it, you, you were given it was thrown, then don't put that as zero. It's zero because it's released at rest. Right? All right, and we can calculate here, uh, well I guess we can put in the final kinetic energy formula, one half mv final squared, make sure you keep your lowercase and your uppercase v separate, this is lowercase v, speed, that's what we're looking for. <coughs> My initial potential energy is a snap because of course I've done everything I can with the uh, pair with the voltage, the only thing I need to calculate the initial potential energy is to multiply in the charge that I decided to put there. So I take my initial voltage, which was 12 volts, right? 
Remember what a volt is. This means 12 joules per coulomb. That means there's 12 joules of potential energy available there per coulomb. How many coulombs am I putting there? One. One. So how much potential energy does it have? 12, right? Plus 12. So that's going to be plus 12 joules. Okay. The final potential energy. But what's the final voltage? Zero. zero. So it has zero joules per coulomb available at that point, point B. So how much potential energy then will this charge have when it gets there? Zero. Zero. Okay? So, this thing started off with plus 12 joules of potential energy and winds up with zero. So where did it go? It went into kinetic. It has, must have 12 joules in kinetic now, right? So you can solve here for the final speed in order for it to have 12 joules of kinetic energy should be um, don't have it written down apparently what would that be? so 2 comes over b squared of 24 meters per second whatever that is so, uh, what? under just under 5 or something? roughly Four point something. Four point nine. Four point nine meters per second. Okay. So that's how fast it would be going at point B. At the point B, it has zero joules of potential energy. So what becomes of it? Does it stop dead? Because it has zero joules of potential energy. Nope. Because it can get even better. It can go to negative potential energies. It will not only roll off the hill, it will gladly roll into the valley because it can get to potential energy values that are even better than zero. In this case, it has access to negative voltage, which is what a positive charge likes to get to. It likes to roll off the hills into valleys, right? It likes to seek the lowest voltage it can. And zero is no particularly big thing if you can access negative, which is even better, right? Now, that's a different story from a charge that's released over here, right? If a positive charge is released over here, then the lowest value of voltage you can get to is zero, because that's the only thing around. But a positive charge that's placed in between those two will have access to a negative voltage. So it'll keep going. In fact, it's no surprise if you look at the original diagram, why would a positive charge stop here in the middle? It's repelled by this plus, yes, but it's also attracted by this minus, so there's no question it just wants to move, continue to move to the right. Okay? It's not like a positive charge over here where the best it can do is go really, really far away. Right? That's the only thing it could do. There, the voltage will be zero at r equals infinity, and that's the best it can get to. That's the lowest voltage that's available to it. But that's not the case with the charge we started with. Remember that there's nothing special about zero if you can do better, okay? If it, if it is accessible, okay? Are there any questions on this example? Good. <clears throat> Let's say you have a plus and a plus charge. My very next say. example. What's that? My next example. Oh. Yes. Um, any other questions on this one? Okay, so let's quickly look at the plus and plus charge. How would that be different? Well, not much. Let's take a look. I'm not going to do this one quite as in depth. But I'll show you a few features that I didn't show you in the last one. Same exact deal. Same exact locations of charge. Um, X equals minus one and X equals plus one. But now, I'll drop both positive charges, so plus Q1 and plus Q2, they will both be positive. And, like on your homework, let's not have it all be in one dimension, let's add a second dimension. So let's say that we might also consider uh, the y-axis. 
Um, let's go ahead and calculate. Let's, let's do an example. Well, first of all, I guess we could say, if you wanted to kind of uh, ask what does the voltage look like along the x-axis, we could sketch that. It looks like this. V versus x, it would be now two peaks, right? Now instead of a hill in a valley, it'd be a hill next to a hill. And one thing is for sure, the um, voltage will never be zero until you get far away, right? Because you have two voltages that are always giving you a plus, so a plus and a plus is always plus. So basically, you have a mountain pass in between these two peaks, but it does not go to zero. Okay? So that's one common mistake. It does not go to zero in between. Okay? It goes to a lower value than when you're right on top of the, one of the charges, but it doesn't go to zero. So you have a peak and a peak. Right? Usually when you have two mountains right next to each other, the gap between them doesn't go all the way down to sea level. Right? Okay, question? As they separate, would that peak get lower? Yes, but it could never truly go to zero until you were infinitely far away. That's right. Um, but instead of just focusing in on the single axis, let me put in a charge somewhere else. So let me say my point of interest is here. And that point is actually uh, one meter away from the origin, but along the y-axis. And let me say, for instance, that that charge, uh, what I'm, I guess I'll call it point P. Let's first find the voltage there. Now, this is, of course, the off-axis kind of stuff is what gets, gets annoying with the, um, with the uh, Sokotoa business and the electric fields, but it's just as easy here. Okay? So just sum up the two contributions. They're both positive, so it'll be a positive number for both. But about the only tricky thing you have to do now is just find out how far you are away. So this is R1, that's how far you're away from this charge, and R2. Those are both equal, by the way. Um, and you just need, need to use a little geometry. This is 1, this is 1, so this is root 2, right? Is that okay? Okay, so R1 and R2 are both root 2 meters, and then you just throw them in, okay? That's it. That's why voltage is so great, no so totally necessary, and if I've done this correctly, the voltage there should be plus 12.7 volts. And if I were to drop a positive charge there, you probably would believe me that it would repel, first of all, it would repel because there's no question, positive repels from other positives. You can also reason that the electric field there, and I'll leave that to you, to reason that the electric field actually points directly along the y-axis, so that would be the move direction that would initially get pushed. Okay? And we can ask, for instance, how fast does it go when it's got repelled really far away? Okay? So we can say, when R final goes to infinity, and of course the voltage final goes to zero, the final potential energy there would then also be zero. So in this system, that's the best you can do. There's no negative charges around to make those valleys, so uh, there's no holes to fall into. You just have that you're getting away from these mountain peaks. These, get, these two hills, you want to roll off them, and you want to roll back down to voltage of zero. And you set it up pretty much the same way. So Ke initial plus Pe initial, Ke final plus Pe final. Let's say you release it from rest, because why not? So we have suppose it's released at rest. That, of course, has to be given in the problem, but let's say it was. We know that here the best you can do is zero. Um, oh, and I guess I should give you the charge. The charge, little q, is going to be plus 1 coulomb. And then I'll leave it to you to figure this out, but basically the, all the potential energy you have initially by being near these two charges is shed as it repels very far away. And you can work it out that the final speed of this charge, oh, and I guess I have to give you the mass, so I'll say it's also a 1 kilogram mass. The final speed should be 5.05 uh, .05 meters per second. Okay, so that these are the two kind of nuts and boltsy things that you have all over your homework, and hopefully you discover 
that it's far easier to execute on these than it was before. All you really have to do is if you're given a point, you need to ask yourself, how far am I away from the charge? And then put in kq over r. r is always positive, it's a distance, but q can, if q is plus, it'll make a b plus. If q is minus, it'll make a b minus. You add up your string of numbers, then you have the voltage to that point. Okay? And that tells you about the potential energy that a charge could have by sitting there, which it will generally then do something, fly off in free space, go somewhere else where the potential energy is different, and of course the energy has to be accounted for somewhere. It's in the kinetic energy, right? Are there any questions on that? Okay, so final order of business on homework number two. This is before we move into circuits, which is going to be much, much more practical uh, for homework number three. Uh, we need to establish some relationships between electric field and voltage, okay? So, electric field and voltage relationships. Now, to preface this, let me remind you that these are two models of viewing the situation, okay? It's not that nature really prefer, is really like one or the other, they're both human models. The electric field is the middleman for the force picture. The voltage is the middleman for energy picture. So it's a matter of if you're thinking of force or energy. They're complementary things. Some model, one model is good for some things, the other is good for others. But it tends to be nice to be able to flip back and forth. Okay? So to be able to say, oh, I actually want to be in the voltage picture instead of the field picture, or vice versa, right? So this is just to help shore up in your mind how to flip back and forth between these two things. You don't need to go all the way back to the beginning just to come back up. You can actually kind of take a shortcut, flip from one picture to the other. So let me talk about that. So if I have a positive charge, we have two options to describe the influence in the space all around it. One is the electric field, and we draw it like this. We draw it as a series of radial lines. And the reason why we draw it as a series of lines, again, just to remind you, is because electric field is the middleman for force. And force is a vector, and so electric field needs a direction as well. So that's why they're pointy arrows, right? The other option we have to describe the space around it is the uh, voltage. And voltage is not a vector, it's a number. And so what we do is we just kind of connect all the points that have the same number, and those are called equipotential, lines of equal potential. And we can draw those like so. So the most obvious basic relationship is this. Um, we also know that positive charges make voltage hills, and so the voltage value gets lower as you go away. And so we have that the electric field points towards lower voltage. So that's the very first basic thing. Electric field points towards lower voltage. Now, I'm not going to do the negative charge, but the negative charge, it also agrees. The negative charge, which way does the electric field point for the negative charge? Towards it. Is that to lower voltage? Yeah, because remember the negative charges are those voltage valleys where the voltage is lower. So this is a general truth regardless of the type of charge you have. So if you ever see voltage values and they're getting lower in a certain direction, the electric field is pointed in that direction. Okay? So those, you can see how it's useful to have a complementary picture. Is that you automatically, if you see voltage values, you can say which way the electric field points, or vice versa, you can work from one to the other. And I should say, when I say points towards lower voltage, I should say most directly towards lower voltage. Okay? So it doesn't mess around when it points towards lower voltage. It points the most direct path towards lower voltage. So, the consequence of that is that the electric field line points 
perpendicular to lines of equipotential. So electric field lines are perpendicular to equipotentials. Okay? If you're not going to mess around and you're going to point the weight towards lower voltage, you should not have any component along a line where the voltage is the same. You're not pointing where you're supposed to. If you want to be pointing towards lower voltage, you have to be perpendicular to lines of equal voltage, right? Now, there's an analogy to this with uh, maps. I mentioned, I think, briefly before that there's an analogy to contour maps. So, for those of you that have ever seen these, so that hopefully this is helpful, there's something called a contour map. Now, oh, if you don't know by name, what a contour map is, is like a map, just like you would look at a road map that, you know, like we're on your phone or whatever, but it has additional information about elevation, okay? So it has, for instance, if you're going hiking in the woods, question, is that like topo? Yes, another name is top topographical map, yeah. So it has, if you're, for instance, going to go out and hike in the woods, you might not just be interested in, okay, how do I get from here to here, but is there like a giant mountain in my way, or is it going to be a flat hike, right? So what you have is these lines like this that kind of indicate something about the landscape. Those lines are lines of equal height, okay? So for a map, they're equal height lines. So it just chooses a scale on the map, like every 300 feet we're gonna drop one of these lines. So if it inclines by 300 feet, uh, then you put another line. Sometimes they even have dotted lines, which indicate that it actually goes down instead of up. So this would be like a hill or a mountain, and this would be like a valley, right? So that would indicate if you choose like Every line is 300 feet of elevation, but the dotted lines indicates that it's 300 feet of drop instead of increase, right? Well, those equal height lines are like our equal potential lines, right? Or equal potential. As an exact, exact analogy, right? So what you might choose, just like you might choose on your contour or topographical map, you might choose that every 300 feet of elevation change you drop a line of equal height, you choose a spacing for your equi uh, potential line. So you choose like every one volt. So this might be like plus nine volts, this might be plus eight volts. You choose, you generally draw equipotentials at equal spacing. So an example would be like every one volt. You draw one of these lines, okay? Now, there is also, and you may not be as familiar with this, um, there is also on maps sometimes what's called a gradient that's drawn, and this indicates what is the most direct downhill. For instance, like if water were to rain were to fall and it were going to roll directly downhill from where it hit, this would be the line that it follows. So there's a line called a gradient line, and it points directly downhill. It doesn't mess around. It points. This is the most downhill you can have. So this is a gradient line. It points directly downhill. Well, that's exactly the same thing as the electric field lines. They don't mess around. They point the way towards lower voltage. Okay? And you can see, just like a ball wants to roll downhill, right? If you drop a ball onto a hillside, which way is it going to go? It's going to go on this gradient line the most directly downhill it can. It's not going to mess around. You're not going to release a ball and it's going to start circling at a common height around the mountain peak, right? It's going to roll directly downhill, okay? So you can see the analogies are pretty much exact, okay? So just like a gradient line points directly downhill, perpendicular to lines of equal height or equal elevation, that's the same relationship electric field has to voltage. So the electric field points most directly towards lower voltage, which means, by definition, it's perpendicular to lines of equal voltage or equipotentials. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so we can take it even further, okay? We can take it, if you're going on a hike, and you're looking at these equal height lines, 
If you want a casual hike, you want to go where the lines are further apart, right? That means where the 300 feet of elevation gain is spread out over a much longer distance, right? So if you wanted to take a casual hike, you should go like this, right? Not like this, okay? So um, you want that 300 feet of elevation gain to happen over many miles, right? Not over an incredibly small distance. That's exactly what we also do with electric field lines and voltage. So, if we choose to draw our voltages at equal spacings, what it means is that, and I guess I'll write down the equation here, the strength of the electric field is proportional to how rapidly the voltage changes with distance. Okay. So if the voltage precipitously plummets from one place to the other, it means you have a strong electric field. If the voltage change is spread out over a long distance, it means a relatively weak electric field. Okay. So let me uh, discuss that. Why that makes sense. Imagine I had a uh, like 100 volts here, and then a, a zero volts like right next to it, or something like that, okay? And they are separated by a relatively short distance, delta r. Well, what that means then, uh, in comparison, let's, let's, this is like scenario A, I guess. I'll label this A, and scenario B, would be the same exact voltage change, plus 100 and 0, but over a larger distance, so a more gradual distance. Okay. So what would be the difference? Well, obviously it's not the voltage change. It's the same delta V, right? We're looking at if a charge went from left to right on both scenarios, let's say it's a positive charge. So positive charge goes from here to here, positive charge goes from here to here. So let's examine what's different and what's the same about these. Well, they both have the same amount of uh, voltage change, right? Well, it's the same amount of voltage change. Well, that means the same amount of potential energy change, right? They're both going to lose the same amount of potential energy. Where does it go? When you lose potential energy? Kinetic energy. Same kinetic energy change. What the heck is the same different about these two scenarios? Well, if you look, they're both going to be going the same kinetic energy and have the same final speed at the end. But the difference is just how rapidly they managed to do that. One took for a lot, much, much longer distance to do this, right? So it'd be like the difference of two cars getting up to 50 miles an hour, okay? But this is some old clunker that took a, little, a couple miles to do it, and this one did it in a very short distance. Obviously, that, there's a difference here. Yes, they did achieve the same speed eventually, but one did it over a much shorter distance. So it's the same speed, but this one did it over a shorter distance. What does that mean about the acceleration of, a, of case A? It's a larger acceleration, and when you see a larger acceleration, what does that mean about the force? Larger force. What's causing the force in this case? The electric field. So what does that mean about the electric field? It has to have a larger electric field. So that's we come up with the supporting uh, conclusion to what we said before, which is that the electric field strength is related to how precipitously the voltage changed with distance. In fact, if we drew here the electric field in both of these situations, 
The electric field certainly points from higher to lower voltage, so it's going to point to the right in both cases. Remember, it's going to have to be perpendicular to the equipotentials, points towards lower voltage. So it, in this case, it must be a uniform field because the spacing of the equipotentials. But over here, I should draw it further apart. This is a weaker electric field. So we conclude that there must be, when you have a very huge plunge, right, in your voltage value in a very short distance, it's like practically falling off a cliff, there is a large force and a large field behind it, whereas if you have a much, much more gradual change in voltage, there isn't as much behind it, right? And a, a per, a perhaps an analogy would be to draw the bit of hillside, right? This would be like, like this, and this would be like this, okay? So if we drew what the hillside looked like, right? So this would be a much more huge plunge, and this would be, you, yes, if you, hopefully you remember from physics one, if you slid down both of these inclines, you would wind up the same speed at the bottom, right? You've given up the same amount of potential energy, right, MGH, if I draw them the same height, you'll drop the same amount of kinetic uh, potential energy, you'll gain the same amount of kinetic energy, but obviously there's a difference between the two, right? This one, you go, you do it in a shorter time, you have a larger acceleration. The acceleration, by the way, comes from the component of gravity, which if you remember from physics one is mg sine theta, it's a much larger component, right? Here, the component of gravity that is along the incline is pretty sad, right? In fact, as you approach flat, there is no component of gravity, right? So just like over here, you have a larger component of force accelerating you harder, right? Here, since the force is due to the electric field, we're of course forced to assume that the electric field is stronger, okay? So, Hopefully I've convinced you that the electric field is tied to how rapidly or precipitously the voltage value changes, okay? And you're going to have to believe me that they're not only proportional, they are exactly equal. So you can actually get the strength of the electric field by measuring the voltage change over some change in distance. This would seem to suggest that the units for electric field are volts per meter, because that's volts over meters. If you actually work it out, volts per meter is actually exactly identical to newtons per coulomb. So if you see the electric field notated in one unit, it's completely equivalent to the other. Okay? So if we go back over to our, our contour map analogy, um, we can, for instance, write that um, what would be the equivalent to mg sine theta, which is the amount of force of gravity that acts with you, the equivalent to that, of course, would be the electrical force, okay? Okay? So with that, to finish up homework number two, I just want to write down a series of statements about the relationship between the two. For those of you that might not be so comfortable with one thing being equal to the rate of change of another, we can write down a series of statements that might be helpful for you to, uh, to see these relationships. Okay. Um, are there any questions before I do that? Just because I have to clear a little room on the board. Okay, so let's write down a series of statements. Um, let's go over here. So right there, let's write down it. If, if the voltage change with distance is doing this, 
then the electric field is doing this. Okay? If the voltage change with distance is gradual, then the electric field is fairly weak. Okay? Okay? So what would that look like on an electric field map? It would look like the equipotential lines are far apart, and so are the electric field lines. So for your electric field mapping lab, if you see that your equipotential lines are far apart, it indicates a relatively weak electric field, and that's of course represented by the electric field lines being far apart, right? If your voltage changes with distance are very uh, rapid, that means your electric field is very strong, right? So if those equipotential lines are close together, so will the electric field lines, okay? So the lines here are closer together, and over here they're close together as well. By the way, I have a perfect example of that right here. I wanted to show you that, right? So here, the lines, equipotential lines are far apart, and the electric field lines are far apart. Here the active potentials are closer together, the electric field lines are closer together, right? So they go like that. These are, by the way, are both examples of uniform electric field, okay? So I guess I should say if the voltage change with this distance are consistent, then the electric field is uniform. So whatever the spacing is, if it's uh, relatively gradual or it's relatively ra rapid, as long as it's consistent, the lines maintain their spacing, and so do these. Okay. So, now, as you can probably guess, we should talk, discuss what about non-uniform fields, because of course those are ones that you see probably more often, right? You're lucky to see a uniform electric field. So you're lucky to see equipotentials maintain their spacing. So what about a point charge? Well, point charge, of course, the electric field gets weaker. That's we represent that by the lines getting further apart. So if the voltage, if the electric field is, I should say, weakening, so it's in the process of, of getting weaker, the lines get progressively further apart. So the line spacing increases. If the electric field line is weakening, what's happening to the voltage change with distance that's becoming more gradual, right? Which means that what's going to happen to the equipotential lines if we draw them every one volt or whatever? Further apart. They're going to get further apart. So the line spacing is going to increase here. This is precisely what you do in the electric field mapping lab is that you uh, stretch, you notice that the equipotential lines are going from more closely spaced to more gradually spaced. Like that. So if you choose to draw them every one volt, you should see that the as the electric field weakens, so then those line spacing increases, you will also see the equipotential lines 
getting further apart. It's like when you look at a contour map, right? If you look and you see where the lines are further apart, that indicates the slope is getting flatter, right? So the just same thing over here. We imagine these as hills with the most rapid climbs being nearby and then it flattening out as you get further away. It's not as big of a deal because you're further away from it, right? And likewise, just like we can imagine that the field weakens as we go away, we can imagine instead walking towards it, right? We would experience a stronger field. And just to finish it, if the electric field line is getting stronger, and the line spacing is going to be uh, decreasing, decreasing spacing, then you're going to have that the um, voltage change with distance become more extreme, so more rapid, and you're going to have those have decreasing spacing. And what I want to point out here is that really there was absolutely no difference between the two lines, okay? Notice the electric field lines are far apart, the equipotentials potentials are far apart. When the electric field lines are closer together, so is the equipotential lines. When these have consistent spacing, they both have consistent spacing, either the spacing increases or the spacing decreases. So really it's just flipping back and forth from one picture to another. You're trading one set of lines with arrows with, for another set of lines that run perpendicular to those that have no arrows but everything that's going on with the spacing is the same, okay? So that's what happens in the, the mapping lab, is that you basically first put down your equipotential lines, and then you flip over and you can draw all the electric field lines uh, from those. Does that make sense? Okay, so you have some questions on that on your uh, homework two as well. Um, and again, um, the analogies are pretty exact, so if you've seen contour maps, great. If you've never seen one of these in your life, then hopefully this makes some sense anyway. Um, any questions, final questions on homework two before I move on to homework three material? <coughs> 